And now we've a novella by D.H. Lawrence, which was written in 1911 at around the same time as Sons and Lovers. It's a classic tale of the struggle between emotion and intellect, about the daughters of a vicar who see marriage as the only means of escape from their routine lives. So I say to you, as our Lord said to his disciples, remember you are Christians and will stand before God on the day of judgment <coughs> without pride, stripped naked of material wealth and riches. Remember all of you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. We shall now sing hymn number 27, Abide With Me. Daughters of the Vicar by D. H. Lawrence. Dramatised for radio by Jane Beeson. My father is the Vicar of Aldercross. Our church crouches in the fields near the cottages and apple trees, like a humped stone and mortar mouse with two little turrets at the corners for ears. The new brick collier house's elbow always nearer, threatening to crush it. But the congregations now are much smaller, as most of the colliers go to chapel. I'm Mary's younger sister, but not at all like her. She is tall and slim and considered a great beauty. I'm short and on the plump side. My hair is a rich gold and I coil it round my head in plaits. People have remarked on my fine grey eyes. Neither Mary nor I have suitors, but then, what chance have we to meet any eligible young men in Aldercross? Our mother is an invalid, her heart chilled and hardened by fear of perpetual penury, the narrow struggle of our existence. If neither Louisa nor I marry, our only chance is to find a position as a governess, or perhaps a schoolteacher. But in either case, the pay is poor and the position humiliating. We've been brought up to be stiff-necked and genteel. We have hardly any real contact with the villagers, which makes for a horrible nothingness in our lives. It seems so dark in the house, but outside the sun is shining. We ought to go for a walk in the fields. The apple blossom is just coming out. Oh, the salt, please, Mary. Oh, why do napkins always slip from the lap? Here it is, Papa. Thank you, Louisa. I called at the Durrance cottage. I don't know how they live with those trains continually passing over the bridge above them. How is their father? I heard he was very ill. <laughs> Not too ill to drink. Mm. Alfred, apparently, has run away to join the Navy. Do him good. Not necessarily, Mama. I wonder what made him decide to go. Mm. Wanted some excitement, I expect. We'll miss him from the choir. Mm. No doubt. But, all things considered, he's better off in the Navy than getting into bad ways here. Was he getting into bad ways? He was not quite as he used to be, Louisa, you have to admit. I don't think we can speak. We know too little about it. Our information is always second-hand, mainly gossip. He was always kind and pleasant, I agree. And generous. I think it's sad he's gone. He was the only one left at home. I expect his mother needs him to help her. At the expense of him taking to drink, like the rest of them. <clears throat> Let's forget the Durrance and talk of a more immediate matter. I heard today that Edward Massey, the son of an old friend of mine, is willing to come and assist me with the church work. Since my recent illness, it's more than I can manage on my own. He should be a most interesting companion for you two girls. He's been at Oxford, written a thesis on Roman law, and is no more than 27. What will this Mr Massey cost us? Fortunately, nothing at all. It's simply for him to get some experience before he takes up his own church in Northamptonshire. 
It has a very good stipend, I believe. But in any case, he has private means. When is he due to arrive? At the end of the week. Perhaps sooner. Mary and Louisa, you must see to the arrangements. I am simply not well enough myself. <clears throat> Mary, weren't you amazed by Papa's announcement? <laughs> I wonder what Mr. Massey will be like. It's exciting, isn't it? The thought of a stranger under our roof. A man at that. I agree, it was quite a shock. Well, if, as Papa says, he's got an MA from Oxford, he must be very clever. Oh, just imagine writing a thesis on Roman law. It'll be a treat to meet someone like that. It'll be a treat to meet someone with different opinions. Oh. Oh, I'm sure Mama hopes he'll suit you, Mary. He has a private income, which is all she cares about. Oh, it's a pity we have to marry. We could apply to teach in the village school. Oh, that's hardly suitable. I don't see why not. Louisa, you never see anything you don't want to. <laughs> you have to understand certain things are possible and others just not. I wonder what Mr Massey will look like. Does it matter? If I ever marry, which seems unlikely, it'll be for love. Surely appearances are very superficial. They matter, though. Well, they would to me. I certainly hope he's as tall as me. <laughs> Is that all? How do you mean? Isn't that quite a lot to ask? What a little abortion of a man that Mr. Massey is. Shh, my dear. We can't help our physical form. God gives it us to rise above. He seems not only physically a poor thing, but to lack in a full range of human feelings. His intellect is considerable. No doubt he will improve our daughter's minds. He speaks like a man who is strongly philosophical. He needs to. His body is almost unthinkable, and his conversation reduces me to silence. My dear, I suggest you guard your tongue. Mr. Massey has a great sense of duty and is a perfect Christian. His work for me is excellent. Mary, at least, is most civil towards him. Oh, dear God. Our beautiful daughter. Is he to be her fate? Uh, ah, Mary. Uh, did you want me? I came to tell you I am going with Mr. Massey on his rounds this afternoon. He needs to know to which homes we deliver the parish almanacs. I admit I had to force myself to accompany him, shuddering and yet desirous. But he didn't seem to notice. But I work, Miss Mary's got a catch. Did you ever see such a shrimp? Yeah, it's a wonder we didn't slip through a hole in her neck. <laughs> I felt a cold sort of admiration for him and was touched with pity for his little padding figure no taller than a boy of twelves, his shoulders bent and buttoned up to his chin in his overcoat. Please, not too fast. I can't keep up. Are you feeling unwell, Mr. Massey? I have an internal trouble. This is the last cottage we have to visit. Then we can return home. If there are more, then we will go on. I don't intend to disappoint your father. Oh, I'm sure Papa will be immensely grateful to you. He has told me so himself. Tomorrow, I believe it's your sister's turn to come with me. I may be wrong, but something tells me she is not your patience, Miss Mary. Oh, I think she has. She is just fundamentally different in nature to me. Yes, indeed. Mary, at last. I've been up here reading for an hour. I wondered whatever had happened to you. Mr. Massey is not used to it. He has difficulty keeping up. With his tiny little legs, I'm not surprised. Worst of all... He seems to lack all feeling. You are too unfair. There is nothing he can do for anyone that he leaves undone. And he's an absolute godsend to Papa. I don't like his kindness. It's calculated. I'll never be like you, Mary. I'll never admire him. He's so thin and sickly looking. I feel a positive desire to exterminate such a creature. Louisa, you shock me. I know. I know. You're a much better person than I am. It was my turn to go with Mr. Massey. 
I steeled myself against the humiliation of being seen with him by the village boys. The Durrants are first on our list. You know the way, I presume, Miss Louisa? Oh, yes, I'll show you. We're almost there. It's under that bridge, under the railway. Down here. Down these steps, Mr. Massey. You walk faster than your sister. I'm sorry, my legs are shorter but more impatient. One's life should not be ruled by one's body. I find my body an accurate indicator of my needs. But dangerous. Why dangerous? I don't understand you. It was Eve's appetite that caused herself and Adam to be thrown from grace. I expect she just had a passion for apples, and why not? This is the Durrance door. Miss Louise, eh? Mrs. Durrant, I hear your poor husband is very ill. This is Mr. Massey, who has come to help out my father. You better come in. Good morning, Mrs. Durrant. And how is your husband? I understand he has taken to his bed. He's no different, and we don't expect him to be. If you'd like to come up. Oh, poor man. He looks so weak. I am so sorry it has come to this. It must be terrible for you. It's I always thought it would be. He's paralysed, see, down his one side. Has he any understanding? They might have some left. Can you hear, Walter? He heard that, I think. Is there nothing we can do for him? Are you upstairs, Mother? I'm up here, my lad. With, with Miss Louisa and, um... Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey. I'm back a bit early, Beth. He's not gone, is he? His mother clung to him as if she needed something to hold on to. He put his arms round her and bent over her, kissing her. I looked away. I could not bear it that I and Mr. Massey should be there. It seemed all wrong. <laughs> Then, Alfred drew himself up, slender as could be. I held out my hand. His hazel eyes recognised me. His white teeth showed in a glimpse of a smile. This is the young vicar with Miss Louisa. Come to help out, Mr Lindley. Pleased to meet you, sir. Yes, indeed. But at a sad time. How are you, Dad? He doesn't know me. No, me boy. <laughs> he, does. he turned away from the bed, and I saw his chest under his sailor's blouse heave. His mother lifted her face and put it against his shoulder, crying aloud. Mr. Massey looked queer and obliterated. So small now. With Alfred in the room. Shall I offer a prayer? He stood waiting. I wanted to die. To have done. I didn't dare turn again to look. Oh God. Whose never failing providence ordereth all things. I can't tell you what it was like, Mary. That strong old woman, quite broken. Thank God Alfred arrived when he did. How did he get home so quickly? He was sent for when his father fell ill. He was like a fine, straight jet of life in the centre of that deathly room. The old man can't live longer than a day or two. I'm sure of it. How difficult it must have been for you and poor Mr Massey. Especially Mr Massey, who is a complete stranger to them. It was embarrassing being with him. I positively hated him. What right had he to be there? Oh, surely he had a right. He is a proper Christian. Perhaps. I couldn't help but revere him just a little when he prayed and made us all kneel with him. 
But he seems to be nearly an imbecile. But he's not an imbecile, Louisa. Well, then, he reminds me of a six-month child. Or a five-month child. As if he didn't have time to get developed enough before he was born. Perhaps there is something lacking in Mr Massey. But there's something wonderful about him, too. And he is really good. Mary! No one, not even you, with all your gentleness and kindness, could like such a feeble specimen of a man. Physically, you couldn't help but despise him. His moral superiority is undeniable, Louisa. And I can feel myself becoming small and submissive before his will. Oh, his will is strong, I admit. But that doesn't necessarily make it good. He thinks deeply. Just compare him with a real man like Alfred Durrant. Oh, it is childish to make the comparison. There is no comparison. Indeed, there is not. Louisa, you are talking wildly and making little sense. <sighs> My dearest, dearest sister, don't whatever you do... Do anything you'll regret. I could ask the same of you. Louisa did not know the depths to which she hurt me, for in my soul I knew what must happen. Mr Massey was the stronger, and I must submit to what he was. My physical self disliked and despised him, but I was in the grip of his moral, mental being. I felt the days allotted out to me while the family watched. Oh, come in, Miss Louisa. Thank you. There's no to do. Walter died in the early hours this morning. Oh, no. How sad it must be for you. He was a fine man. Aye, oh, when he was younger, he was. But the mines finished him. The drink, see, all on them drink when they come up out. Who can blame them? I know. I can understand them. I'd be no different coming up out of that dark labyrinth of tunnels and shafts, like moles. He's laid out in the parlour. Alfred brought him down. Where is he now? Alfred? Oh, he's gone about the burial. Well, that'll be him now. Come in, son. Mother. It's Louisa. I'll, uh, I'll go and sit with Walter. I'm sorry about your father, Alfred. It was for the best. I know. There must be a lot to do at such a time. Hmm. Can I help you? Fine. Have you seen The Undertaker? Not yet. I could go for you. As you please. I don't want to be in the way. If you'd rather... I can go on my own time. But I want to eat somewhere before I do. Mother must eat too. I can cook. What do you usually have? Mother's made it. She leaves it in the stove overnight. So is there any way at all I can be of use? Mother and I are used to it, see? Father hasn't been able to do for himself since a while back. When do you have to rejoin your ship? I've asked for compassionate leave. And they've agreed? I don't reckon there'll be any trouble. Mother and I'll manage it. I thought I almost hated him. It was his way of getting out of it. I felt the cowardice of it. Him placing me in a superior class and placing himself inaccessibly apart. As if I didn't count. But I was too dogged to submit. Uh, come in. Oh, it's you, Massey. I hope 
I'm not disturbing you, sir. No, no. Uh, uh, sit down. I prefer to stand. Uh, well, uh, is there something the matter? I came to ask you for Miss Mary's hand in marriage. Uh, uh, oh, dear. There goes my Bible. Let me... Uh, thank you. Thank you. As for your request, I should be glad. But, of course, the decision lies with Mary. <laughs> I trust she will not be averse to such a step. She has always seemed happy accompanying me on my visits and expressed admiration for my moral sense of duty. I'll go and ask her now. Miss Mary? Miss Mary? Miss Mary? At last I found you. I believe you were hiding from me. I didn't hear you. I thought this afternoon we might extend our visits, venture beyond our previous limit. You see, I suspect some of our parishioners have ceased to come to church. It's because it's a long walk for them. I'm afraid it's the disadvantage of a fast-growing village. I was afraid of what was coming and sat stiff with apprehension. I felt as if my body would rise up and fling him aside, but my spirit quivered and waited, almost in expectation, almost wanting him. I have already asked, Mr Lindley. I felt myself go cold and impervious, almost as if I were stone. Will you become my wife, Mary? I should like to speak to Mama first. Very well. If I'd let myself, I'd have hated Mr Massey. His thin voice devoid of human understanding. The male in him cold and self-complete and utterly domineering, weak as he was. So I decided I would not feel. I would live in a higher freedom than I'd ever known, a pure will towards right. I'd shut myself rigidly against the agonies of shame and the terror of violation. Your father thinks it would not be a bad match. And you? You agree? It's your decision, Mary. I see. Hello! Oh, it was such fun. You should have been there. I really enjoy the choir. What's the matter? Nothing's the matter. Then why are you so serious? Sort of distant? Am I? I didn't know I was. Something has happened. Tell me. She's going to marry Edward Massey. No. If he had come to me, I'd have flipped him out of the room. That, that specimen. Well, he hasn't come to you. Oh, Mary, I know you are a higher being than me, but... But... How can your beautiful body respond to his pathetic, ugly one? My body is a lower thing. I am glad to be rid of it. But your true self is ashamed of him. How could it not be? Or are you afraid of him? Of course not. She's made up her mind and that's the end of it. I don't agree with you about him, Louisa. I'd beg the streets barefoot first. I want to marry him. And that's all there is I have to say to you. Mama! Mama, how could you let her do it? How could you? Be quiet, Louisa, or Mr Massey will hear you. I don't care. I hope he does. Mary is murdering herself and you both know it. She has made the choice. Because of you! To procure money, she has sold away her life. Oh, Think if she had a child like the father. My dear Louisa, most of us suffer in one way or another. 
My life has been spent in this gloomy old house, wrestling with tradesmen's bills. At least materially, Mary will not want, and she'll have the social standing money brings with it. I cannot begin to understand you, Mama. Poverty has reduced me to permanent illness. The parishioners' lack of respect for your father. It is not poverty that has affected the parishioners, but fathers and your lack of understanding, your isolation and superiority. It's because of the money, isn't it? You dislike the whole affair, but back away because of the money. Whatever happens to Edward Massey, Mary is safe for life. I'd rather be safe in the workhouse. <laughs> Your father will see to that. So I was isolated from everybody. Mary and I still loved each other and would do so as long as we lived. But our ways had parted. I would go my own way. But which way? How could I be said to have any way? All I had was a fixed will to love, to have a man I loved. I reckon it's snowing up top of shaft, Alfred. Look up above you. We're for this now, I'm glad on it. Come just right for Christmas. We fossil will attend for nearly ten years. A green Christmas, a fat churchyard is what him says. <laughs> hey, you're right. Flakes coming down the top of cage. Oh, it's good to feel the open air. Well, the light will be near making a mole of me after the black weed come out, eh? I like the crunch of clean snow under my boots. Hope Mother's kept a good fire, Bonin. What brought you out of the Navy, lad? I'd had enough in it. My mother needs help. I didn't go much for life on board ship, though I got to see some of the world. And to your women? I reckon so. Most of the crew went out drinking in port. I tried once or twice, but I never fancied it. I bet your mother's glad to have you back. She counts on me. She's a fine woman. Handsome, well-built lad like you ought to get yourself a wife. When I'd known I was with child, I'd felt for the first time a horror. Afraid before God and man. But it was a healthy boy we named Jack. And the flesh that was silent and trampled in me spoke again. Edward, who had never been aware of anyone else in his life, now became only aware of the child. It was the same when our second baby was born three years later. So I persuaded Edward to let us all come away, because the days in his rectory were always of the same dark fabric, and it frightened me. It's such a treat to have you home again, if only for a visit, and the children. <laughs> How oh, happy you must be. Oh, yes! <laughs> oh, but when Jack was born, I, I felt as if my purpose in life was broken in two. It, it was as if... as if a part of me came alive again. It's hard to explain. No, no, I understand you perfectly. I think it's wonderful. Baby, it's fine, Mary. It's a feast time. In fact, it is five minutes past you. Will you come down? In a minute. Could you pick her up while I unpack her things? Oh, when I first suckled Jack, Louisa, I felt such an anguish of love. Poor little thing. He cried and my breasts filled. I couldn't prevent them. I adored it when his lips closed on my nipple and he sucked. But why should you have wanted to prevent what's right and natural? Mary, I think it would be better to give Betty a warm bath before you feed her, or she may catch cold. We're coming down. Why don't you give her to Louisa, <laughs> Edward? She's quite warm inside her shawl, isn't she? Good morning. Oh. Have you got a support? Oh, her neck. Oh, yes. Oh. Pretty, a pretty little pretty. 
Ricky, come on. <laughs> oh, she's lovely, Mary. Now get her flannels. If you want. I could bath her in the kitchen. Oh, the girl is scrubbing there. Surely it's not necessary to bath her at this time of day. She'd better have one. Whatever is Mary doing up there? Why doesn't she come down to eat? She's staying with Baby. The room's cold. Perhaps the girl could light the fire. The girl's gone home. Mary has had nothing to eat. It is she who will catch cold. I'll take her something. It seems to me ridiculous. Oh, all right. I'll go and get her. Do come down, Mary. You must be starved. I'll be down in a moment or two. I can't stand any more. I'm going out. I may or may not be home to tea. Mrs. Durrant? Mrs. Durrant? She shouldn't be out in the garden in this cold. Oh, my God. Mrs. <gasps> Durrant! Hey. What if it's happened? Yeah, I, I was pulling the Brussels sprouts talking. Oh, oh someone tore inside me. Oh, I've shut you. Babe. I felt it coming a long time, and now, oh, oh, I've said nothing. I didn't want to upset our Alfred. Let me help you up. Uh, you can walk a little if I hold you, and we'll get you in by the fire. Yes, but, but get a cabbage. I want it for Alfred's dinner. Uh, oh, they're frozen in the ground. Uh, no wonder you hurt yourself. Well, there's a lump in my side. I think I must have torn it. Can you manage oh. to walk as far as the door? Oh, you feel dreadfully oh. cold. Yes. 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 There. Can you sit down in your chair and I'll wrap you in a blanket. Oh. Find someone to call the doctor. Oh. There you go. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. I'm sorry if I hurt you. You've got to warm you up. What time is it? Quarter to four. Oh, oh Alfred will be here soon and his supper's not ready. Well, I'll make him something. There's that cabbage and you find the meat in yes. the pantry. And, and an apple pie you cannot talk, but, but don't you do it. Who will then? I don't know. But, but he wants a good fire. I can work as well as anyone, Mrs. Uh, Durrant. You just lie quiet. Or you won't be fit to see Alfred when he gets back. Oh. How much worth of oil do you reckon to save by a candle, Mother? I saw you, sir. Yeah. It's late in the day. Your mother's had an accident. She all right? She's in bed. The doctor's been. I'll go up. Mother? Yeah. What have you done? Oh, nothing, lad. You needn't fret. It's nothing more the matter with me than I had yesterday or last week. The doctor said I'd done nothing serious. What were you doing? Oh, pulling up a Brussels sprout. Oh, that was so such a pain. What'd you have to go pulling up Brussels for? And the ground frozen hard. Well, somebody's got to get him. You don't need to go doing yourself harm. Are you sure it's nothing much, Mother? Aye, it's nothing. I don't want you to... to be badly, you know. They're only cosseting me up because I'm an old woman. Miss Louise is very good. She'll have got your supper ready, so you'd better go and eat it. It was strange and exciting for me, trying to understand him and his mother. He was turned away from his food, looking in the fire. 
his black face and arms uncouth, foreign, his face marked black with coal dust. I could see him, but not know him. I can see you think I ought to wash before I eat. No. I was thinking I ought to go up and bring the flannels down for reheating. They'll soothe her pain. Is her bad? I think she is. I'll go up now. suffering dreadfully. I'll bring you up a fresh brand back as quick as I can. Uh, what's Alfred about? He need his back washing. He can't abide it if his back in washed. Oh, don't you worry. I'll give him a hand. Oh. He was kneeling on the hearth rug stripped to the waist, washing in a large pansion of earthenware, mechanically rubbing the white lather on his head with a repeated, sensuous movement. He bent his head into the water, washing it free of soap, pressed the water from his eyes. Your mother says you'll need your back washing. There's the soap and flannel. I felt the almost repulsive intimacy forced on me. All so common, all like herding. I sensed the difference between me and the working people. His arms were plunged in black water. Even the soap froth was darkish grey. He seemed hardly human, yet his skin was unblemished. A lovely, opaque, solid white. I could sense his living centre. My heart ran hot. I reached out to this beautiful, clear male body. It fascinated me. My separateness passed and I felt drawn into the slopping water. The rhythm. My arms' movement over the curve of his back. Your neck's still black. <laughs> I've been carrying gold bags on it. I'd be scared down there in the dark. My soul opened. I felt strange and pregnant. He'd become an intimate being to me. Looks white enough now. I'd uh, better get back up to your mother with the hot flannels while you dry off. I can see you're a little easier, Mrs. Durrant. You mustn't mind, Miss Louisa. Mind? What should I mind? The, the black of the lad is what we're used to. <laughs> How do you feel, Mother? Oh, a bit better. This strange putting herself aside and answering him only what she thought good for him made him seem ineffectual, so nothing. I felt I was groping to find him. I'd better fetch Mrs. Harrison. They did not include me in their lives. I felt hurt and powerless. I suppose we shall have to have someone. I'll stay and do the nursing. We'll manage to get somebody. I'll stay until tomorrow in any case, and then we can see. Oh, I'm sure you've no right to trouble yourself. I must write a note to the vicarage. I'll fetch another candle so you can see to right. Thank you, Alfred. I'm not used to being waited on. He seemed to me so self-contained, so utterly sure in his movement. How was I ever to approach him, for he'd take not one step towards me? I am so sorry for this unfortunate news, Mr. Durrant. <clears throat> Uh, Mary will be down with the clothes that Louisa needs shortly. Uh, is there anything else we can do to help you? I hope not, sir. But my mother's not well at all. Hmm. It'll help with Miss Louisa staying over to give us a hand. 
dear, oh dear. Uh, but your mother must be getting on now, isn't she? Here, yeah, Mr. Durrant. I think I've found all that Louisa will need. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, God bless her. Uh, I take it the doctor's been? Yes, yeah, sir. <sighs> An honest man. There's no doubt of that. Should I go to work? Oh, I think I'd go, my boy. You want me to? Yes. Go to work. I've got Miss Louisa with me. I lay on the mattress on the floor on the far side of his mother's bed. I could see him bending over his mother. Then he let his hand down from the candle and the light fell on me. I shut my eyes quickly buried my face in the pillow, drew my two plaits in among the bedclothes. Alfred. What, Mother? You always do what's right, Alfred. Yes. Uh, kiss me, my boy. Hey then, lad. How was your mother doing? Not so good. It's hard when the mother goes. But perhaps she'll rally yet. She's in good hands. That's her. What's going on down here? Uh, there's been a bit of a fall. Two of them got closed in last night, but they got through to them in the early hours. This pit's too old to walk. Unless they replace the roof timbers. Aye, but we won't spare the money nor the tide. No good grumbling if we know what's good for us. Alfred? Alfred? Yes? It had to be Alfred. She went very quickly, quietly. She was a brave and fine person. I know how close you were. How you must suffer. Huh? You did half expect it. It's not come as a shock to you. It's a shock. But I guessed as much. I couldn't bear to think you hadn't guessed. My sister would like you to come to supper one evening, if you'd be so good. She suggested it. I'll come if you want me. Uh, will you take some slices of chicken, Alfred? And potato and carrots? I don't have an appetite. <laughs> but you must eat something. A very small portion, then. If he doesn't want it, Mama. But it's not good for him to starve. Mama, please allow Alfred the choice. Uh, we take water at dinner. Uh, oh, there is some beer in the larder. Water will do me well enough. Yeah. I'm afraid we can't have any music later because of the children. Edward is in bed with a cold, too. Uh, what plans have you for the future, uh, now your good mother is no longer in need of you? I might emigrate to Canada. Ah. I've thought of it before now. Why don't you, Alfred? I've heard life is free and open there. And each one has as good a chance as the next to make his own way. It's a very long way from home, though. I don't know as how it would bother me now mother's gone. We'd miss you. But for you, it would be exciting. A challenge. It would be that, I reckon. Oh, it was so embarrassing, Mary. I suffered terribly for Alfred. 
I felt furious with our parents for patronising him. Even when I spoke, I sounded patronising to myself. I couldn't seem to help it. He can't be at ease with us because his manners are so different. But none of that matters. It doesn't matter, but it makes him uncomfortable. That's why he didn't want to eat. Oh, I wish we'd never asked him. We only tried to do our best. Alfred, I've been wanting to call on you. I thought I'd come today because now the evenings are long and light and and the blossom on your apple bough is so beautiful. Come ahead. Yeah. Sit down by the fire. In Mother's chair. No. No. I'll sit here. I ought to have washed by now. <laughs> I don't mind. Your arms are black as black, but so are all miners. There was the reserve, the simple neutrality in him that I dreaded. It made it impossible for me to approach him. It's Dottie White right enough. Alfred. What is it? Nothing. I'm afraid it was silly to have asked you to dinner at that time. I'm not used to it. Oh, it, it's not that. It was my family being so stiff. How do you get on alone? Eyes. How close it is in this room. The fire is big enough for winter. What were you thinking about so deeply that you forgot to wash? <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Will you keep this house on? Oh, hardly know. I'm very likely going to Canada. What for? Well, try the life. But which life? There's various things. Farming or lumbering or mining. I don't mind much what it is. And is that what you want? I don't know till I've tried. Wouldn't you be sorry to leave this house? I don't know. I suppose our Fred will come in. It's always wanting. You don't want to settle down? He was leaning forward on the arms of his chair. He turned away from me. You going out tonight? I'll be down the new inn. I'm lucky to have caught you in. I mustn't keep you. He was so reserved in manner, I didn't know how to break the distance between us. Where did I put my hat? There it is. I stood, pinning my hat. In a moment, there would be no alternative but to go. Then suddenly, a sharp pang seared me. I was beyond myself. Do you want me to go? Why? Do you really want me to go? Why? Because I wanted to stay with you. I got my coat. The moment had come. I had to go. But his eyes held me like two points of torture. I had no will. No life anymore. Don't you want me? I... I... Something drew him from his chair to me. I stood motionless. He put his hand tentatively on my arm. The expression on his face was strange and inhuman. He clumsily put his arms round me. Louis. I love you. Let me just hold you. Peace and the passion of it almost breaks my heart. I want your mouth. Your mouth on mine. 
His mouth came closer and closer. My eyelids closed. I was lost in a kind of death of myself. A moment of utter darkness came over me as he cruelly, blindly strained me to him until I nearly lost consciousness. After a while, his arms slackened and I loosed myself a little, put my arms round him. We held each other for assurance, unable to find words. Your face is black. <laughs> Yours is smudged a bit. It was as though we were afraid to talk, to break the spell. I'll see your blouses, Dutty. I don't mind. What will we do? How do you mean? About me. What do you want me to do? I don't want to let you go. But make yourself clean. I wish you didn't have to go. Come tomorrow and ask father. Young man, am I to understand you asked Miss Louisa if she would marry you? Yes? If she would marry me, sir. I hope you don't mind. You are a good-looking man, but that is hardly enough for the basis of a marriage. Was my daughter willing to marry you? Yes. <clears throat> Will you come this way to see the rest of my family? In his voice, it I seems been no staying reason why, sir. <clears throat> This young man has come on your account. Louisa? Yes. You don't want to marry a collier, you little fool. Hush, mother. What means have you to support a wife? I think I can earn enough. Well? And how much? Seven and six a day. Are you going to live in that pokey little house? I think so. If it's all right. Then she's a fool, I tell you, if she marries you. After all, Mama, it is Louise's affair. We must remember... As she makes her bed, she must lie on it. But she'll repent it. Louisa is not really free to act without consideration for the rest of her family, Mary. What do you want, Papa? I mean that if you marry this man, it will make things very difficult for me. Particularly if you stay in this parish. If you were to move away... It would be simpler. But living here, in a collier's cottage, under my nose, as it were, would be almost unseemly. Come over here, young man. Let's look at you. Can't you take her away and live out of sight? You'd both of you be better off. Yes. We can go away. Do you want to go? If it's going to be a trouble to anybody. But for yourself, you'd rather stay. It's my home. It's the house where I was born. Then I really don't see how you can make such a condition, Papa. He has his own rights, and if Louisa wants to marry him... Louisa? Louisa? I cannot understand why Louisa shouldn't behave in the normal way. I can't see why she should only think of herself and forget the family. But I love Alfred, Papa. And I hope you love your parents. I hope you want to spare us as much of the... The, the loss of prestige, as possible. We can go away to live. Yes. Easily. Uh, I think it would really be better. Very likely it would. <laughs> Though I think we should apologise for asking such a thing. No. It'll be best all round. Shall we put up the bands here or go to the registrar? We will go to the registrar. Well, if you will have your own way, you must go your own way. There's baby Mary. I'll go. I'll come with you. It's not necessary, Edward. And uh, where do you think you'll go when you're married? I was thinking of emigrating. To Canada? Or where? I think to Canada. Yes. Yes, that would be a good idea. We shan't see much of you, then, as a son-in-law. Not much. It's very far. 
I'll never see Mary. Nor any one of you. I'd best be going. I'll come with you to the gate. You won't mind them, will you? I don't mind them if they don't mind me. Come here. Oh, my Louisa. Let us be married soon, Alfred. All right. I'll go tomorrow to Barford so it's fixed. I shan't see you again. No. So I've come to... to be with you just for a little. If you want me to. I shall miss you always, Louisa. Sometimes I even envy you. But we have each made our bed, as our mother says. Oh, Mary. Oh, Mary. How can I live without you? Dearest sister, you chose to renounce your family in favour of Alfred. Yes. I love him. Then you'll be all right. Alfred's a good and kind man. And you? I have my children. Edward is devoted to them. Yes. Yes, of course. In Daughters of the Vicar by D. H. Lawrence, Louisa was played by Rachel Atkins and Mary by Kathy Sarah. Mrs. Lindley was Gillian Goodman, Mr. Lindley, David Timpson, and Mr. Massey, Robert Pickavance. Alfred was played by Pete Meakin, Mrs. Durrant, Anne Rye, and the minor was Sean Connolly. Daughters of the Vicar was dramatised for radio by Jane Beeson and directed in Birmingham by Peter Leslie Wilde.